Welcome to another message from God's Word. The title of this message tonight is Resting in Faith. Resting in Faith, and sometimes that's real hard to do. My wife is constantly uh, trying to get me to rest. She says I need to rest. And I probably do need to rest more than I do. The Word of God tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 8, it says, For in grace ye are having been saved through faith, and that not out of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. These are promises in the Word of God. Now, <clears throat> what happens when you raise a child? Mothers and fathers out there. What happens when you are married for 15 or 20 years and your spouse, male or female, whichever one it might be, takes off and leaves you? Or begins to lie about you? cheat on you, despise you when you have loved them? What happens when your children turn against you? What happens when you raise your children in, in the hopes of salvation and the hopes that they will serve God and love God like you do? Then they go away. Resting in faith. Resting in faith. Your job is to be the best wife or husband you can be. And the best mother and father you can be. That is your job. Now God will hold you accountable for that. He will. In the Word of God, in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, tells you how the husband is to love the wife, children respect your parents, honor your mother and honor your father, and all of these things. Uh, uh, it says honor your mother and father, for that is the first commandment with a promise. Here in the fifteenth chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, Kara Luca. We have a story, and I probably would say that this is a true story. It really happened. Mm -hmm. And mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, you will have all tasted of this bitter, bitter cup. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. Now the first of all, the first thing, if a son would have done this, it could have been a capital punishment. You can only receive what you got coming when the father is dead. You're wishing your father dead. And so, this was a great sin of the son. But we have the love of the father. The love of the father that is greater than the sin of the son. The father rested in faith. This is a, one of the greatest examples of resting in faith in the Bible. My grand, great-grandfather... Harry Lee Stewart. Had a son, I believe Bill was born in 1903. He named him Willie, after his uncle Willie Paul. William Augustus, also my great-grandmother, had a, an uncle that his name was Augustus. So she named him from her brother and from her uncle, T. 
a nameless boy. And Willie or Bill turned out to be a horrible person. He killed three men that I know of. He was a drunk, a thief. Bill could not come into your house without stealing something. My mother had several boyfriends when I was young. And uh, sometimes the boyfriends will try to get close to the mother by buying the children presents. And so I had some presents. I had a train set, a Lionel train set. We didn't have any place to put it. I lived in a shack with a dirt floor with no electricity. But I got a Lionel train set. My mother lived in a different house from where I and my grandmother lived. And my Uncle Bill stole that and went, took off and sold it for wine. He stole everything I had. I, I had one of my uncles give a, uh, a watch, Timex watch to me, and that was and that's the watch that took it licking and kept on ticking. And, and if you sent them back to the, to the uh, Timex watch company, they'd give you another one. Well, Bill gave me this. Uh, my uncle, other uncle Bill, gave this to me. Actually, it was my dad's nephew, Dale's nephew, Billy Buford. He gave this watch to me. I sent it off to the Timex watch company. Got it in the mail. Bill intercepted it. He's gone. Why? The only things that I had left from my childhood, that little toys and things I had, I, I, in the house that my mother lived in, was a hole in the wall. For my sister and one of her boyfriends knocked a hole in the wall. And in that hole in the wall, I took a little blue toy car and the wa and the and the. Uh, a knife that my grandfather had given to me. And I put him in that wall. And that wall, Dale come along and plaster up the wall. Probably 30 years later at least, I bought that house. And I went into the bedroom. I, it had paneling on the wall. I took the paneling off the wall and I looked where it had been plastered and I knocked a hole in that wall and I retrieved my little blue toy car and my grandfather's knife. If I had not put them in there, my Uncle Bill would have sold them. I still have them. You've seen those, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. My Uncle Bill beat me up every time he could, try to pull my hair out, pull my ears off of my head. He was mean. One time out in the backyard, he went down to Wattenberger's and bought a double bit axe because they chopped wood for a wood stove in the, in the shack that he lived in. And he came by me and I was a little boy, about three or four years old, sitting down looking at an encyclopedia. And I was concentrating on the pictures, trying to read the words. He came by and hit me with that axe handle as hard as he could hit me. And today, my heart is still has a, a, a rhythm from that. My neighbor saw what he did, came over there and gave me artificial respiration and revived me. He almost killed me for nothing. I despised him. I hated him. Because of what he did to me. When my grandmother was dying, she was run over a car in 1960. Of course, I was 12 years old at that time. She got hit in this car. She lived a week. My grandfather lived two weeks. I stayed up in the hospital day and night praying for my grandmother to live. She was just busted all to pieces. Drunk driver ran over. Knocked her 278 feet. Bill was up there and he was teasing me about my grandmother. They had the meat wagons coming. She was coming after she's dying. And I was sitting there crying. I mean, it was breaking my heart. That's my world with my grandmother. She raised me. The only person that ever loved me in this world. Mm -hmm. that time. He came in my house after my grandmother died. My mother's house, that is. And I was there. I would stay there a little while, go different places and I was like an orphan, just 
staying here and staying there. But I went in my mother's house and he was stealing candy goods and things out of the house, putting them in a wagon. I said, Bill, what are you doing here? He said, Dottie gave this to me. I just went berserk. I picked up a BB gun and just beat him with it. Beat him with it. And ran him off. I despised him. That really broke my heart when he said that. I just lost it. Years later, alcoholism and drinking cheap wine, had, he had diabetes and he had Jan Green in one of his legs. They didn't expect him to live, but they had cut the leg off. And I was preaching at that time. And I went to the hospital. God put it on my heart to go talk to this snake, the hush <coughs> serpent. I went in there with a vengeance. I walked in there and his leg was cut off. There was blood all around where his leg was leaking. And he was a tough old man, mean old man. He was dried out. He was sober then. He'd been in the hospital for two or three weeks and they said it, he didn't have much of a chance to live. I went in there and I told my Uncle Bill, I said, Bill, God put it on my heart to talk to you. And here I am. And I don't like you at all. I know how miserable you are, how vicious, how much of a murderer you are that you got by with. I know you cut that man's head off for a bottle of wine, decapitated him down on Canal Bank. I know you killed the other man, knocked him down and took his money. I know that you stabbed Clifford Smith through his body with his knife when you were drinking his vanilla extract in his kitchen in the middle of the night. And all the other things that you've done, the horrible things that you did to me and my friends. And I said, if anybody in this world deserves to go to hell, you're it. I said, you're the worst person that I've ever known, Bill. You're number one. He was crying. Crying. I said, Bill, you deserve to go to hell. You are on your way. I said, you may be breathing your last breath today. I don't know. But when you leave this world, you're going to go to hell and you're going to answer for all the things that you have done. And all the times you beat me and almost killed me for no reason. But Jesus Christ died for your sins also, Bill. And he will save your soul if you ask him. And I figured that was going to be the end of it. And he'd say, jump in the creek. He said, Jimmy, I want to be saved. <laughs> I didn't want to lead him in prayer. I did. He lived several years after that. Several, ten years, I guess. When I'd go by his house to see him, I'd pray with him, and he'd pray with me. He was baptized. He gave money to the church and said it to the, to the liquor store. He would give money to me and tell me to put it in an offering plate. Just a few dollars. He didn't have much. And when he died, he wanted me to have the things I gave him. I gave him a, a panoramic picture of Jerusalem. He wanted me to have that guy. He wanted me to have his Bibles. And it was probably ten years after he died that my cousin called me and said, Jimmy, he said, I know Bill wanted you to have these things and I'm going to leave them at your mother's house. And so I went out there and there and he sang for her. But the two old Bibles, one of them 1903, the other one 1928. And the first Bible was inscribed, To my son Willie, may the Lord bless you and may he call you to a high calling. And may you know him personally. And these scriptures will make you wise unto salvation. And then he wrote scriptures down. He's a baby when he wrote this Bible to him. And then in 1928, 
living a wild life and a reckless life, his father gave him another Bible. <clears throat> his father prayed for him from the time he was born and before he was born. My great-grandmother was a little reckless and a little bit wild. My grandfather, great-grandfather, was steady as a rock and a Christian. He wrote that Bible and he wrote down scriptures and he highlighted scriptures all the way through that with an old red pencil. And he said, Willie, these scriptures will make you wise unto salvation. And Bill, this will make a good sermon. This will make a good sermon. He wanted that boy, that wild boy, to be a preacher. And here I was involved in this eternal situation, eternity. We all will live in eternity. And my Uncle Bill deserved to go to hell, but his father had prayed for him all the years of his life until 1930-something when he died. And God answered his prayers. My grandfather, Harry Lee Stewart, an old Indian man, that was afraid to tell anybody he was Indian because of the persecution in the Oklahoma Indian Territory. Paul Valley. Prayed for that boy. And 70 years later, he was saved. Harry Stewart rested in faith. He rested in faith. This old man here that we're talking about rested in faith. We can do the best for our children, for our wives, for our husbands in this world. And if we fail them, we'll always remember it. They'll remember your failures, not how you followed the Word of God. And not many days later, their younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. I have known women and men. Sometimes men live, live off of women, don't they? You've known that in your life, some of you. And sometimes women will marry a man only to live off of the man. That's all she, they don't care for. They will never be faithful. They'll never love them. Never. I've seen women have children that despise them. Despise their every breath. Wish them dead. That happens, doesn't it? We've experienced that. We've seen it. I used to go on a bus ministry. I started the bus ministry at New Old Missionary Baptist Church. I went to hundreds of homes and I saw children that were abused horribly. I saw husbands that were abused and I saw wives that were abused. Horribly. I went into one home one time. The mother and all six children were saved. The boys were delinquents. Risen, miserable people. In trouble all the time. When they got saved, their whole life changed. They, didn't, they weren't called to the school all the time to pick up little Junior. And the father was so mad that he threatened to burn my house down and everything that he could think of. He didn't want his children to go to church. Yet he, he was in prison. He was a prisoner, ex-prisoner, ex-convict. I didn't know why the man hated me. I said, man, his wife loves him now. She respects him. She, she bows down to his needs and all of this before everybody was going every direction in that home. Why did this man hate me so bad? Why did he hate that his wife now loved him and surrendered to him? And that his children were not delinquents anymore, that they were going to Sunday school and reading the Bible and praising God and praying at meal time. 
They were never in trouble. One of those boys showed up at a little place I used to live in. He pulled up there. I was just there visiting. I didn't live there anymore. And these boys, this man and woman come up, this young man and woman, with babies. He said, Brother Phillips. I said, yeah. He said, you don't remember me. I don't think you. My mom and dad live right down here, and I had five brothers and sisters. He said, two of my brothers were killed by gangsters. But we were all saved. My father went back to prison, and my mother got married again, and she has a good life. Thank you for taking us to church and leading us to the Lord. I said, what do you mean your father went back to prison? He said, oh, years before that, he had robbed the liquor stores down on Edison Highway, and it clicked why the man hated me. He robbed me, and I was so sharp, I, I told him what gun he had, what he looked like. I picked him out on the lineup. And he went to prison because of me. I'd forgotten him, but he hadn't forgotten me. I'll tell you what, he came in there and he robbed that store, that service station I was working at, and he told me to go into the oil room and turn my back and not turn around. He had this long barrel, nine and a half inch barrel, Harrington and Richardson, nine shot, and holding that thing with a hammer pulled back on me. You know how hard it is to turn your back on somebody like that? I told him how much money he got and what kind of pistol it was and the ammunition that he had in his hand, a box of 22 shells. I was afraid he was going to kill me. I called the priest. I was terrified. I was up all night long going to the lineup and describing him or whatever. Well, he got to all the lecture stores again. And then I remembered why the man hated me. His children's life were turned around. His life was turned around, but he was still a convict like he was before. He was still an outlaw. And he hated me because he had gone to jail. Resting in faith. Maybe their grandmother and grandfathers had prayed for those little boys and girls. They found Jesus. Now when he had spent everything in severe famine, occurred in the country and he began to be in need. Prayers. The prayers of my great-grandfather worked. God heard them. They were written in stone on the heart of God. My grandfather rested in faith. When, he, when my grandfather died, his, his son had just run off with Clark Gable's a stepmother from William Gable. My Uncle Bill took off with his wife, Gladys. He was really being riotlessly, riotlessly, the drunken mess. I never knew why Gladys walked off and left William Gable for my Uncle Bill to live in poverty. You got a picture of her with a mink soul on her and a beautiful glamour thing with dark Gable there and all of them. And she left all of that to be with my Uncle Bill, an outlaw, a drunk and a murderer. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country and, this, and sent him into the fields to feed swine. That's really a good job for a, a Jewish boy, isn't it? Feeding pigs. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything to eat. But when he came to his sentence, hey, look at that. The old man's prayers were answered, resting in faith. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough to eat bread? But I am dying here of hunger in this terrible land. I will go up, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight, before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of, the, of your hired men. Why, his father could have had him executed, stoned. What about the father? What about Harry Stewart loving that boy that was so rebellious and, and such a terrible person? 
How about that man that, that despised his children because they had become born again and saved and they were no longer like he was? Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and he came to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kept on kissing him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Love. Resting in faith. That man, even though that boy went on, I know the man kept praying for him. Look at Job. How he prayed for his sons and his daughters and he made sacrifices for them. And bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For the son of mine was dead and he has come to life again. He was lost and he has been found and they began to be merry. Now we've all experienced this too, jealousy. Now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Jealousy. Now this boy should have been happy that his brother had come back and was alive now when he was dead, spiritually. And he summoned one of the servants and began, and he kept on inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf. And because he has received him back safe and sound, resting in faith, But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and kept on entreating and begging him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I've never neglected a command of yours, and yet you never gave me a kid, a fatty cat, that I might be married with my friends. But when this son of yours came, this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with harlots. You killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, My child, you have always been with me. And all that is mine is yours. Everything I have is yours. Your son, your, your brother has no more inheritance. He has nothing. It's all over with. It's all gone. What I give to him is by love only. Uh, my daughter, she's on Facebook a lot, and I have a Facebook page for discoverword.com. And I saw a little thing that she put on Facebook. She never said anything to me about this at all. She said, if your mother or father do to you anything for you after you're 18 years old, it's just because they love you. It's pure love. Mm -hmm. It's pure love. I raised my children. I, when they were 18 years old, I taught them to be on their own. I taught them to be on their own. My boys, my youngest boy called me here a while back. He always griped because I think, he said I made him work too hard. I taught him how to work. We work with horses. We clean things up. We, we went out and, and took jobs of cleaning property up. And I, we cut firewood. I had a firewood business. I would deliver between 100 and 250 cords of wood a year. That's a lot of wood people. And them boys work with me. I taught them how to work. They were raised like they were on a farm. But I'll guarantee you one thing. When they went to work for somebody else, they knew how to pick up a shovel and a hole and everything else. They didn't have to be taught. They could work on their own cars. They could build a house. They could lay concrete. They knew how to work with electricity. They knew how to do plumbing. I taught them everything. My son called me, the one that used to gripe so much, he called me the other day and he told me, he said, Dad, I never realized it until now. He's almost 50 years old. He said, you really did something that not hardly any of my friends, fathers did. You taught us how to work. I've never, ever 
been afraid to work on any job. And he says, my son, I taught him to work, Richard. He said his boss told him the other day, whoever taught you how to work, you'll need to thank him. He said it was my dad. And Gary said to me, I never thanked you, Dad, for teaching me how to work. I thank you now. I thank you now. Take time with your children. Take them out and teach them how to sweat. Might make them want to get a real good job. <laughs> and get out of that sun and heat and cold. My sons work with me, and I tell you what, I work right with them all the time. There's nobody. Marilyn, you ever know anybody work harder than me? Mm -hmm. No. Me. We we work. We work. <laughs> we work. We work. I taught my boys how to work. This man taught his son how to work. And he did. He said, Son, everything that I have is yours. Rest in faith. Rest in faith. Resting in faith. But we had to be merry and rejoice for your brother of yours was dead and has become alive. And he was lost and now he's been found. Resting in faith. He told that boy, rest in faith, it's all yours. We talk about heaven, don't we? Heaven. Have you ever seen heaven? I haven't. I've, I've read about it being described a little bit. I think heaven is so great that we can't even describe it. Well, there's no pain, no tears, no sorrow, no hunger, no thirst. I've experienced all of those things many times over. But when I go to heaven, I won't feel it anymore at all. Go to heaven, there won't be any perjury and there won't be any false witnesses and there won't be anybody tearing your name down. I've had plenty of that in my life. I've had a lot of lies against me. I'll just tell you one thing. The more you follow the Lord, the, the more the devil's going to be on your tail. Right there. I always know where he is. He's about three feet behind me. All the time. But rest in faith. For in grace you're having been saved through faith, and that is a gift of God. A gift of God. Resting in faith. Resting in grace. And it's so hard to do, isn't it, sometimes? I go down and lay down to rest, and I just sit there. I'm, I'm laying down, but I'm thinking about all the things i got to be doing and what I should be doing. I go to bed at night and I said I should have preached another message. I got a message on my heart. And tonight it's late. But I had to preach this message. This message is on my heart. Resting in faith. Are you going through hard times? Are you? Is your life miserable? You don't know how you can even wake up in the morning and open your eyes to the world that you're living in? Rest in faith. It's got to get better because it couldn't get worse. I've seen that. I used to go work in the oil fields. It was so horrible and so dangerous and so nasty and so hot and so cold. So everything bad. Dangerous. Oh, I said, Lord, please help me get out of this. Get to another day alive. Another day alive. God will get you through. God will get you through all of it. Resting in faith. You need it. I know some of you out there need this message really bad. Resting in faith. You're going through hard times. You're going through trials. Resting in faith. Children turn against your spouse, turn against you, lie about you, tear you up inside so your heart first of all and then who you are it just real destroys you Satan's at work the closer you get to him the more he will 
The more closer you get to God, the more Satan will get to you, but rest in faith. Resting in faith. My great grandfather rested in faith. This man here on the prodigal son rested in faith. And I had taught my children the best I could. And I hand them over to God. And rest in faith. Our Father, we commit this message to you for your honor, for your glory. Help it heal our hearts. Help us give us encouragement. And help us to strive us on to greater things. Father, I pray for all of my students out there all over the world. Those that are working in hard places, that living with spouses that are not saved, spouses that leave them, spouses that hate them, palace spouses that abuse them, children that turn their back on them. Father, I pray for all of these that they'll rest in faith. And it's hard to do that, I know, Father. I pray for all those from one end of the world to the other. Last month, Father, we had more downloads in India than any other place in China. I don't know those people there, but I know you know them. And I hope this message touches their hearts. I pray for all the steady listeners and supporters. I pray that you encourage them to give more and to give more of their lives to you. To strive on. I pray for each and every one of them. Birmingham, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Texas, New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Virginia, Wales, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines. This goes all over, Father. I pray for each and every one of them. Touch their lives and help them to rest in faith. Father, please forgive me, right, Bill. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.